cruising the streets, curb crawling, girls falling by the way, hunting his prey. From shadows is seen the lost man, semi-aware he sits in his father's old ford, with its caved in passenger's door, and coloured drag mark across its fender. Jerry, the jazz man, gerrymandering the box, and out it pops. To reveal the stench of ageing electroacoustic transducers found rotting in last week's lunch. Those old headphones bound by tape black red in colour, the same as his mat hair, plead a haunting song. A howling response comes from the overgrown rotted stalactitle and mitle teeth. His twisted moustache hides. The tapping of feet on floor, scraping paper in two over bare metal rings, the sound of a silent drum. Then he arrives. Valiant man, on time, every time, Jerry whispered to the night. Valiant man stopped his valiant steed right next to Jerry's home. Where people dumped their lives, their rubbish, their loves, night and day. Jerry first sought those pretty seaboard when he at once caught Jerry's eye. You're gonna get caught, man. Jazz spoke while watching him stride to the wagon's rear with an excitement born a long time ago. From fear, growling, what do we have here? As the tailgate fell and a large worn rug unfurled. Looking intently to find a better view, Jerry spied the long blonde blood draped hair fall from its end as he dragged it to his shoulder and then out of view. He's a big folk, the jazz man squirmed. I wouldn't want to bump into him in an alley on a dark night, no sir. His prickies are big in filth and in grime, and I know how to find villain and gifts left behind. He must be bored with the game we play within my mind since we find on that first day. Swaggering strides glide his valiant stance, now empty in hand. The jazz man slides down onto the floor, man. As his valiant steed at 3,000 revolutions per minute drives, as it did arrive, away. Jerry sat alone. Always alone. Parked up tight to an old wood fence made back whence in Jerry's youth with his secret three-picket doorway. Flitting in and out of shadows cast in Jerry's past and dancing with the grace of a great ballerina, one happy hippo in a tutu from the childhood love of mother and her joyous rendition of Fantasia. Dancing atop life's lost filth, Jerry manders his steps, lacking grace, falling hard, seeking his prize. Within the decaying ruins of his mind, Jerry finds the shining white of her rose, shimmering in moonlight, calling his name. Jerry. Jerry. Every week I see his gift left for me, sleeping beauties under flower and soil amongst rubbish and brush. No returns. This thing in my home can stay in the game we play, not him, but I care for you, the divine in your last repose. Sliding his eager fingers into earth, mounding soil to the sides, memories steal into his mind of mother, planting father's rye. Jerry, the jasmine, gerrymandering the hole, scraping the edge of a woven fold, and with one final scoop, 
truth would be told. A chrysalis, a cocoon, enveloped in wrap, enclosed, calling for his attention, satisfying his anticipation. In awe, Jerry weeps, tears falling onto her shroud, salted tears entwined with globs of rolling sweat trailing to the pretty lost, now found. With gentle hands, frail, not old, reaching beneath the tasseled folds, he brings to the surface his white rose to show her one last kindness. Finally, finally, finally I give the life he denied. The words spilled from his lips as he gave one last pull and unfurled his gift. Caught in moonshine, silky, milky white skin, dressed against the dark of her wrap, foregrounding the blood red of her lips. With the last of the unveiling, Jerry catches his breath. As he counts, one, two, three, ten perfect fingers. One, two, three, ten perfect toes. Revering her form, how it moulds to the rug. She's so close to being the most perfect gift I ever did see. A valiant effort by a valiant man. Caught up in the wonder of this night, Jerry sways to a tune only he hears. Sweeping aside her blood-soaked hair To see what was hiding there Green, your eyes are green And he reached for the knife, Dad's gift With blade erect, he took those eyes out of her head Crying the words, they're They're green. green The horror of those eyes reach into the depths of Jerry's past. She's looking at me. She's looking at me just like you looked at me. He cried accusingly at the unseen mother at his side. Ever at his side. Those Those eyes eyes that that pierce pierce a man's soul with your looking, with with your green green eyes looking. He cried as he tossed those eyes back to the pit from where they were dug, dragging his white rose to lay across his legs. He cried. His father's wife stroked his hanging, weeping, sobbing head, looking at him with her dead green eyes. A flash lit up the scene. It's that night already. Jerry sniffed and grinned. He pulled his rose tight against his chest and started to sing a lullaby as his white rose slept. Tug and Stew, the Tuggly Stew, watching the LCD on LSD, the psychoactive trance of their bro-romance, while riding a psychedelic wave with hashish, chilling their days. Looking in windows, stealing secrets, quiet as mice, not very nice. Wearing Friday shorts on a Wednesday. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, which house to toss? Only I know. She crooned. Todd, a bloke with half a brain, responded lyrically the same. Eeny, meeny, miny, moe, move it along, let's fucking go. Down in the cans, rubbish and rot, Jerry heard their song with its recapitulations and weaselly orations break off. 
with their noisy trap along the sidewalk tips, Todd pulled Stu back, covering his lips. What did you do that for? complained Irish Stu. Todd now shut up. In a wide-eyed attempt at Morse code, Todd recognised, then realised that a brain now codicised could not be honed. Using his words, Todd whispered and said, Stop if I can talk and there's something ahead. Stu fell silent the first time in years, when a strange tune accosted his ears. Shaking with fright, Stu dosy doed and eeny meeny miny moed. What the fuck's that song? Nobody knows. Todd smiled wryly, then chin lifted the fence to try for a look at the songster unmet. In his darkness, Jerry turned and saw Todd's head and two squirmy hands holding him atop Jerry's fence. Is tonight the night you go, go too far? Will it be told in your organic planted beneath the weeping willow in the back of my yard? Not that I've thought about it at all. The last time Toddy Stew peeked in on you, you ended up with your head in a noose, Mother Sue. The bear of Reachville cried the loon, and since me release, I've thought a lot about Toddy Stew. Toddly Stew, they've seen it all. They watched Lady Mappleberry take a hard fall, a sight they believed would scar their recalls forever. There's Mr. and Mrs. Who the fuck are they? With Toddly Stew stopping by occasionally to make sure. Who the fuck are they? Are still able to do that thing with what the fuck is that? Then old man Crabby Pants, named by Toddly Stew. He's as mean as shit and carries a load or two. Yet with all their peekings in windows and doors, nothing prepared them for what they saw. Sitting on the ground beside a shallow grave, sat Littlefinger, a corpse across his legs. One more step, Tommy Stew, and it's all over for you. Jerry ruminated, contemplated, and excogitated what next to do. Obviously much brighter than Jerry believed, Toddy Stu turned and fled the scene. Call on the cops, cause that's what you do. Toddy Stu waited where Craven Lenay was selecting journalistic food. Sergeant Groves, first on scene, interviewed two chemically psychoactive stoners riding their psychedelic wave of hash cookies, brownies and pot. Groves sent cops to the block with orders to Gape, not gape! At the site said to hide ritual secrets. Crowds had assembled, the loon in the lead with Seamus Macbeth leaning against a certain old Ford, one you might recall, with his eyes so green. Take witness statements! Groves commanded, then trundled down to the soil mounded that Jerry did toil with his hands to uncover Valiant's gift. Do not disturb! That's all that was heard as Groves disappeared into Reachville's preferred transfer station. For moments he stood watching, seeking, looking down at another almost perfect victim. In a perceived effort to check out all sides, he scanned the ground, then knelt down on the rug, cradling the divine. With a slip of his wrist, the flap he did lift of a pocket on the leg of his jeans, worn specifically for this very deed. 
Sliding out slow but quick, not shy but sure, the short length of the two ninety nine set of pruning shears from Mr. Durango's store. A quick glance around to check the scene for neighbours, sticky beaks and TV. He snipped off his pinky, sliding it into the plastic lined pocket of his jeans. From outside the cave, Looney took the lead, televising, vocalising and ensuring that everyone watching events unfold from the safety of their homes felt they stood by her side. Valiant man with his valiant stance sat himself down watching the gruesome discovery on TV. Feeling victorious cheer, cracking a cold beer, cringing at the loony's voice as it drilled into his thinking. Suddenly peeking as the loony speaking revealed an inconsistency causing exultation and trepidation surrounding the location of his girl's eyes. I had been Victory fled and instead he strode to his valiant steed, speaking. Not my girl, no, not mine. And in no time he glided to a stop not far from his nighttime activities. Making his way to a televised scene, confusion, confliction, confounding reports. Not my girl, no distinguishes the key back to me. Jerry, the jazz man, gerrymandering the fox and Oppie Pops, fleet of foot and quick as a wit, he lay down his rose with careful intent, leaping across walkways, laneways and fence, taking men's clothing from lines as he went. Oh, by the way, he reached the safety of Mrs. Sumac's house. She's at her sister's again. Washed up, cleaned up, Jerry stood with the crowd when a familiar sound caught his attention. His eyes popped wide, thoughts danced through his head as that black silhouette filled him with dread. Restrain, constrain, encumbered, to suppress. A growing tremor arising in his chest. Jerry silent laughter at. Proximity alert, proximity alert. Standing right next to him. The scene was set. Valiant man stood between Jerry and Tommy Jerry could feel the heat of his form brush along the edges of his new jacket. Found last week steaming amongst the discarded bag of ejected excreted defecations of weak old sweating kitten and Although not wanting to know Valiant Man's identity. He's standing right next to me. How could I not look? And just as the jazz man decided to see, from out of nowhere, Sergeant Groves commanded all eyes on him as he came in to see. A short cough. <coughs> in an effort at composure, he interjected, interposed in a tone not loud, not low, and spoke these words to the scores of onlookers, observers, and spectators. Littlefinger has struck once more. Craven Lune, not surprised, uncaring, seeking the prize to greener. You think I'm going to say eyes, don't you? <laughs> but no. <laughs> she stepped right up and mic'd his face and asked him how he knew. Straightening his tie, readying his lie, Grove said, There are nine fingers, not ten, and a slice is new. Jerry's tremor stopped, mirroring the surprise in Valiant Man's eyes with their piercing green hue. Shocked her horror, thoughts of evisceration shot through Jerry's brain, unable to look away from those piercing green eyes. They are looking, just looking. They have no right to be looking at me. Jerry's thoughts were in a frenzy, mulling over causations, operations for eviscerations in removing those eyes that were looking. As Grove's final words he heard over and over again in his head. There are nine fingers.
with the lens and zoom. Just like the ocean to remind me of 